Okay, uh, then I would like to wish everybody welcome to this year's uh, Anna Politkovskaya seminar. Um, I can't see you out there, of course. I don't know how many there are of you, um, but I know we have a very interesting program and I also know it's 12 o'clock. So I think we'll just hit it off now. Um, so my name is Åge Borkvink and I'm an uh, advisor at the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. And uh, every year the Norwegian Helsinki Committee hosts an event in memory of Anna Politkovskaya who was arguably Russia's most famous investigative journalist. And we knew her from uh, meeting her many times, both uh, here in uh, Norway and uh, also in Moscow. She was killed in 2006 and the murder, uh, although uh, it remains partly unsolved, although some people have gone to jail, we still don't know who uh, ordered the uh, attack on her and why. So the Anna Politkovskaya events aim to present themes relevant to freedom of expression, human rights and investigative journalism in the context of Russia. And I should maybe add that also the themes of security and politics uh, usually enter into um, discussions and probably will today. So um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, Irina uh, Baragan and Andrei Soldatov, uh, <laughs> our just, uh, guests. Uh, and we certainly could have no better or more qualified guests uh, than this year's duo. Um, Irina and Andrei are among the uh, most recognized investigative journalists of Russia today. Um, they are now sitting in a basement, it seems. Uh, exactly. In, uh, yes. So I hope you're okay there. But the, you tell me it's, uh, you are now in London at King's College, yes? Yes. yes. But it's not actually the building of King's College. <laughs> it's your own basement, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, <clears throat> among the things that you have uh, published are three... Um, First, as you said, you are a specialist uh, on the secret services uh, or security services of uh, Russia, which is uh, quite a wide topic and uh, extensive. Um, and you have published three books, namely The New Nobility, which I believe was in 2010 or 9? Exactly, 2010. Exactly, 2010. And then uh, uh, The Red Web. Um, about uh, uh, Russia's uh, uh, or the Russian state's bit difficult relationship with uh, the internet yep. uh, in 2015, but you had to uh, make new um, um, editions all the time, I guess, because if the, the book was always getting chased by events and <laughs> yes. had to be expanded. Uh, and now, lastly, from uh, 2019, The Compatriots, which is a, um, um, uh, a presentation of uh, uh, Russia's foreign intelligence, but also of the, uh, the role of the uh, uh, Russian emigre population in Russian politics, uh, uh, I should say. So uh, we have titled our seminar a bit provocatively, Why did Russia hack the Norwegian parliament? Of course, we don't really know that they did, uh, but this is the assumption of the Norwegian police and, um, uh, and uh, also of uh, uh, Norwegian uh, politicians. I had a quote uh, just from one of them, which I think is maybe interesting to you because it says something about uh, the reaction of Norwegian society, or at least part of it, to this uh, attack on our parliament. And uh, I'll try to translate it. Uh, for uh, the Kremlin, there are no uh, clear distinction between war and peace. The Russians are experts at using the gray zones between war and peace. Irregular operations, cyber attacks, uh, liquidations, manipulations, false news and propaganda are the tools the, uh, Russia are using uh, against the, uh, the West. And the Russian, uh, uh, the Russia's, Russia's aim is to undermine uh, Western democracies and redefine reality uh, in order to legitimize its own actions. So it's 
pretty harsh uh, uh, words. This is coming from the uh, representative of the government party, the conservative party, Horek Elvnes, who is a spokesman on security and defense uh, at Stortinge, uh, and obviously was kind of um, irate after this uh, attack. Um, <clears throat> But I would like to uh, come back to the topic of Norway uh, later and start with asking you a little bit about your books, your uh, bibliography, as it were. Um, so, um, so, uh, so prepare yourself to talk a little about uh, a little bit about the new nobility uh, from 2010, which, uh, uh, as far as I understand, because I have to admit that book I have not read, the others two I have. Uh, is a description of the um, uh, uh, Putin's elite uh, and of the first part of his uh, now very long uh, tenure as Russia's president. Uh, and before we start, um, I, I, I wanted also to share a uh, quote by Vladimir Nabokov from his uh, memoir, Speak Memory. Um, now he is not uh, usually um, seen as a political thinker or uh, a commentator at all. He kind of uh, detested that, basically. But he says here that, uh, 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 and, and I now will quote, the history of Russia uh, could be considered from two points of views, both of which, uh, yeah, first, as the evolution of the police, a curiously impersonal and detached force, sometimes working in a kind of void, sometimes helpless, and at other times outdoing the government in brutal persecution. And second, as the development of a marvelous culture. So what I find interesting is that he is kind of uh, portraying uh, the, the police uh, in Russia as kind of a you know spinal cord unbroken from the time of uh, uh, Ivan the Terrible, more or less, up to today. So you have all these great changes and revolutions, but there is a backbone that goes from one period to the other. Uh, so um, on that note, uh, I would like you to talk a little bit about the new nobility. Who is the new uh, nobility? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, having us. And yes, the book was uh, uh, written in uh, 2009 uh, and published in 2010. And um, it was a, actually, we tried to, uh, to present in, in that book what we uh, did as uh, investigative journalist for almost 10 years because we started uh, writing about the Russian security services in 1999, uh, basically for two reasons, because in 1999, uh, the Second Chechen War started, uh, which was presented to the public as a counter-terrorism operation. And the Russian security services, they uh, had the leading role in the war. And also because of uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, because he came to power and uh, he was from uh, from the KGB and we wanted to explore this topic. But it was um, almost immediately clear that um, Vladimir Putin, uh, when he came to power, he brought with him a lot of people uh, with the same background and uh, they were very proud of being from the KGB. And at the same time, um, they try to style themselves as um, simultaneously uh, successors to the KGB, but also uh, to uh, Russian Tsar Okhrana. So you're absolutely right. Uh, there is oh, aristocrats, yeah. Uh, so there is this uh, continuity, uh, at least for, for the people inside of the Russian secret services. Uh, and it's uh, kind of striking how you can be both, how you can be successors to Cheka and to the people who were killed by Cheka. But apparently nobody, nobody uh, had any problem uh, with, the, with this idea because we wanted to present themselves as a new Russian aristocracy, the new class of people who might uh, protect Russia, who might lead Russia and um, defend the country from all kinds of uh, enemies. And the book was actually the, the study to some extent of uh, how successful uh, they were. And um, back when in 2009, 2010, 
uh, Dmitry Medvedev uh, was president and uh, there was some hope for liberal change in the country. And um, actually what we uh, understood by 2010 that um, largely with uh, people from the KGB uh, were not really successful at protecting the country from, say, counter from, from terrorism. Um, they were not really successful as a new elite because they constantly fought one another and uh, constantly there were some problems with corruption inside and uh, they turned out to be really greedy and uh, uh, they wanted these uh, very profitable positions and businesses everywhere. And uh, of course, they tried to justify that by the big national idea, but they failed on so many fronts. Uh, they, for instance, we were tasked to provide the, the new national idea for Russia uh, to replace communism and uh, what we had uh, back in the 19th century. And again, they failed. The only thing they produced was the idea of uh, servitude. What we are people and we are, we are to serve any regime in this country, no matter what it's, what it's doing. And it's, it's hardly a big national idea. And it's, it was not really appealing. And uh, in, the, in the end of the book, we, uh, we sort of, we had this line that we hope that if Dmitry Medvedev is serious about democratization and liberalization, so probably something could be done with uh, all these people and uh, with uh, these agencies. Uh, Unfortunately, as we all know now, uh, Vladimir Putin got back and uh, all these hopes for uh, liberalizations and reforms, especially in the security services, were completely crushed. And uh, to some extent, it make our book more actual. So it's 10 years old, but many people we described, they still uh, held the same positions in the security services. The system became so stuck and so immovable and so solid that you see the same people uh, doing the same thing for now almost 20 years. Uh, some of them were appointed by Putin back in the early 2000s. Only now Putin started changing some people in the security services, but it's, it's very, it's very, um, uh, there is nothing that actually is, is going inside, except it's getting more and more aggressive uh, and repressive. But in 2009, you still had some hopes that there could be changes introduced that would lead to an evolution somehow uh, in, uh, say, a, a liberal direction. Uh, that that was the gist of your book uh, uh, at extent, the time, yeah. yes? Uh, yeah. To some extent, but we, I don't know, a lot of people, especially middle classes, were amazed by Dmitry Medvedev and his rule back in 2008-2010. But we, uh, frankly speaking, we did not, because uh, we understood uh, uh, even then that Medvedev could be a little bit a little bit could present a little bit milder regime, but it it, it would be also the regime. Uh, and uh, I remember that Dmitry Medvedev launched uh, a program which he called uh, anti-extremist program in Russia, which means uh, that the state, uh, the, the Russian state started a fight against, uh, against uh, political opponents, against people who, have, who, who are critical of the Kremlin, against people who are dissidents, who, are, who, who just promote the ideas on uh, which are not promoted by the Kremlin. And this program was launched by Dmitry Medvedev personally during his rule. So we understood that, uh, that Dmitry Medvedev is uh, not Yeltsin and even Gorbachev, but, uh, but at the same time, he was better than Putin. <laughs> at least he was not from the KGB. At least. <laughs> but he was from St. Petersburg, uh, as I recall. So. Yeah, so it's not so bad. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, Nabokov too was from St. Petersburg. Yeah. Um, no, it's uh, interesting because uh, in your uh, uh, last book, you 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 uh, you make a reference to a um, a program which I believe was on Echo Moskvi or uh, uh, the yes. radio, which was uh, uh, from the two thousand um, years. 
and uh, and uh, and uh, was aimed at trying to understand the emerging middle class basically uh, and why they were so supportive of Putin, I guess, was uh, kind of the question a little bit because uh, uh, Ecto Moschi was a very liberal uh, and, and remains so today uh, radio station. But uh, um, but then you, then you have a very interesting, uh, 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 you, you mentioned an interview with, uh, uh, I think his name is Ilya Saslavsky. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, and he, he uh, who later became an, uh, an anti-corruption uh, um, prominent figure in, in denouncing corruption in Russia. But at the time, he had the different opinions uh, about the uh, um, uh, state of, of Russia. He was positive, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, he was, uh, uh, he was a guy who actually uh, he had uh, uh, an American passport and he um, uh, got back to Russia uh, in 2000s because he understood with his brother that uh, there was a possibility under Putin to make a lot of money. And uh, he, I think he started in some old business as, a, as an expert uh, and analytics. And uh, he was absolutely fine. He, he was making a lot of money. British Petroleum. Uh, for, uh, yeah, he actually he worked for uh, British Petroleum. And he has a very nice flat, uh, flat in, in Moscow. He had a beautiful girlfriend. Uh, he was even thinking about producing some movies because he had some money for that. And all of a sudden, everything was just crushed because um, one of the biggest Russian oil company, uh, Rosneft, uh, went into a fight with uh, British Petroleum, and they needed some 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 victims, uh, some some targets, and they attacked scapegoats. Scapegoats, yeah. yeah. They attacked some small fish, and uh, this guy, yeah, he uh, he was chosen to be this small fish. To be sacrificed in this fight, and he, he was arrested, accused of uh, uh, industrial espionage, and uh, everything was uh, all of a sudden very gloomy for him. And finally, he was uh, uh, he was uh, released, and he left the country, and now he lives in the United States. Uh, but of course, this sudden change of his fate uh, well made a big impact on him. And it was a signal for many people, because it was not the only case, that in Russia, you might be in position to make some money, but there are no security, there, is no, there, are, there are no guarantees for you, because there are no institutions to protect you. And if some big shot decide to do something about you, or your company, or your friends, or your family, everything could happen. There is no security. And uh, all of a sudden, they started thinking that money is not enough that they need some, some democratic institutions, something they always despised and uh, attack people like us. And I remember that very clearly in the early 2000s uh, when you walk into a room with, um, with people uh, who work for, uh, for, work for big corporations, uh, they attack you with uh, nasty questions like, well, you are still politically active, uh, politics is a dirty business. Uh, you are probably corrupt. Maybe I can pay you 200 euros to, uh, to write a story about my company, this kind of stuff. And um, all of a sudden, in 10 years, we understood, wow, probably we do need some democratic institutions because it's not, it's not about some big guys like uh, Hadarkovsky or it's not about uh, Chechens, but it's about themselves. Yeah, to be sure, to be sure. Russians are... Uh have been thinking for a long time that money is right and that's all and uh, back then in uh, 10 years ago 15 years ago it was very difficult to explain uh, to the middle classes that money does not provide that money doesn't provide rights uh, by definition you could be in vulnerable position if you don't have any kind of institutions that could protect your rights but that was the problem for us. We failed as journalists to explain this to Russian population. But, but now people understand that money does not provide your rights. Yeah. It's not enough. A lot of people with big money, rich people, were sent to prison by Putin and by the regime. And uh, a lot of people lost. I don't know, people who are not so rich but also have some money. They uh, lost uh, their positions and money because of corrupted system, because uh, somebody was interested to grab their business. 
And now it's easier to explain people that money does not provide rights. Yeah, but it was not like that in 10 years but ago. But it was extremely difficult then, like mm. extremely difficult. So his story is a bit uh, like uh, um, emblematic of uh, how middle class has changed its perception on uh, on power and um, and uh, uh, authority in Russia then, um, Saslavsky. Uh, of course, the 2000s uh, were also years of a very high oil price. So I guess the revenues of the Russian state was extremely big. And if you have a lot of money to distribute, you know, yeah, maybe it's exactly. easier to believe in it. And then, that's true. Uh, that's true. Absolutely true. When there the party is over, then of course, yeah. yeah, there was enough money for middle classes back then. And uh, when they this money finished, it mm. happened uh, in 2011, 2012. People went to street. <laughs> mm. Could could you uh, say a little bit more about uh, the new nobility? Uh, who are they? Of course, we know that uh, Putin uh, was a former KGB colonel, or uh, um, um, and with uh, was stationed in in East Germany for a while. Um, but uh, um, who who are the, the the others the new nobility? What are the important institutions? How did they kind of come to power, and why are there have they proven so uh, good or adept at maintaining power? Well, the problem is that uh, every I would say every Russian leader and Soviet leader always relied on people uh, he and you from uh, his earlier years. Uh, well, Gorbachev uh, brought to power lots of people from his region, from Krasnodar. Yeltsin Stavropol. did, uh, Stavropol, excuse me. Uh, and uh, Yeltsin did the same with uh, Yekaterinburg. And uh, it was kind of um, uh, expected that Vladimir Putin uh, would get his people from St. Petersburg. The problem was that his people, people he knew personally, uh, most of them uh, share the same background. They either uh, served back in the KGB or they served in the new uh, Russian security services. And um, the problem with these people was that they shared the same mentality. And this mentality is very specific. Uh, first of all, it means that these people, all of them, they see the world, uh, any problem which could emerge in uh, terms of threats. So you, for instance, you have the internet emerging and immediately you think, wow, what kind of threat it could pose to you and your political stability? Uh, you have new technologies. And again, the first question is what kind of threat it poses to you? And it's a very special kind of mentality. It makes you and them extremely suspicious of outsiders. And what Putin did and his people when he placed them in, uh, in, in powerful positions, they started attacking uh, every kind of outsiders, from journalists to experts and to the society. They believed that all these people, they try to interfere in the government business. And uh, this kind of interference is dangerous by definition. So Putin, if you remember, Putin started uh, attacking the media almost immediately after he came to power. Uh, he had this pretext of the Second Chechen War and that Russian journalists undermined the, the Russian military effort in Chechnya. But actually his idea was to, uh, to read off all kinds of journalists uh, and to make them completely insignificant. He started, of course, with journalists and the media critical of the Kremlin. But now we see that uh, even pro-Kremlin journalists, uh, they, they became completely insignificant. They don't have access to, uh, to the parliament. They don't have real access to the government. They don't have any access to the Kremlin, very small access. Uh, and that was his goal. And the problem that it was this idea, this concept uh, was uh, uh, shared by many, many people. And we are talking about not just thousands of people, but about thousands of people. And here Putin um, was building up on some Soviet legacy. Back in the Soviet Union, uh, the KGB had a special technique. It was called to have attached officers. What does it mean? You have some, for instance, big newspaper. And of course, it's already uh, 
uh, under control of the Communist Party, completely loyal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it might be useful as a cover for some special activities. For instance, you need to uh, send your spies to to Africa or to to Western Europe, and um, well, journalistic cover is the best cover. So what you do, you just attach your officers to this newspaper. And it goes to uh, many institutions. You can attach your officers to almost anything uh, and uh, inside the country or outside. Inside the country, they used that under pretext of uh, so-called counterintelligence um, um, of, of counterintelligence. Uh, for instance, you have some very important plant of uh, industrial object. Uh, producing something really important for uh, for the country, and uh, and you expect uh, that um, Western spies would want to uh, to undermine and uh, this facility and to send their spies to this facility and to spy on it. For that, you need to have a special attached officer to supervise this plant, and it was very old-fashioned tactics. But nevertheless, Putin found a way how to use it. Uh, he started attaching his people almost everywhere. Uh, we describe it in our book, In the New Nobility, a case uh, when a ballet school with uh, the Bolshoi Theater got a new guy from the FSB. As a deputy there. Uh, he, he was a deputy head of the ballet school. And just imagine <laughs> why they got a guy from the FSB. Uh, to very, very clever place to put him because they would be popular and invited everywhere, I suppose. <laughs> Maybe. And uh, of course, um, it confused everybody, including uh, people from the FSB. Uh, we, with Irina, had a friend of us back then from the FSB uh, who was really not really bad guy. And uh, he was an expert in counterterrorism. And one day he was um, given a new assignment. Uh, he was attached to, um, to a very famous school in Moscow. Uh, which uh, trains uh, ac actors uh, for theater. And uh, he spent two, three days there. And uh, after that, we had a meeting with him. And he got to this meeting really confused and said, look, I don't know what I am supposed to do there, but I have some idea. Probably I need to fight drugs. And I was really surprised and asked him, why drugs? He said, well, you know, I, one day I walked the corridors of this, um, of this school and I saw several people standing in front of the mirrors and doing some crazy moves, probably they do on drugs. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, these guys, they are actors. They need to train. That's, that's the way we do things. That's the way they train themselves. Mm -hmm. But for him, it was such a big surprise. And he thought, well, probably they were on drugs. <laughs> Yeah, sounds very professional. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, with the um, establishment of the new nobility, I guess uh, uh, Putin had to make certain deals. And uh, uh, I, I was wondering about uh, uh, his relationship, if you could talk a little bit about it. Maybe it's a general question, but uh, with the oligarchs, the people that made a lot of money during the 90s. So um, in the... Uh, compatriots, for instance, you describe how um, one of them, Boris Beresovsky, tried to like establish more or less a commission or a party of oligarchs, so as that they could, you know, unite and have a shared in interest and therefore become a more forceful um, force in, in, in Russian politics. But uh, he definitely failed and, uh, 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 and is no longer alive. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the new nobility and its relationship to the um, to the oligarchs of the 1990s. Uh, Putin's and the new nobility relationship with Russian oligarchs are very complicated, and uh, it has changed. It, they has changed a lot since since the 90s because in the 90s, oligarchs were powerful in the country and a lot of people uh, from the security services was, was hi were hired by oligarchs uh, and they are uh, uh, in, in, in order to in order to provide the security for, for the new Russian companies for the banks uh, and so on and but of course uh, 
the former KGB generals, the former KGB colonels, they were, they didn't like that, that they were hired by oligarchs. They wanted to be oligarchs by themselves and they wanted to be uh, people who define the, uh, the uh, life in their country as it, as it used to be in the 80s and in the 70s. But when Putin came to power in 2000, the situation for the security services and people from the security services improved dramatically. And they used the possibility to not only to serve the oligarchs, but uh, to be, uh, but to be, I mean, uh, people who are generals, they immediately uh, demanded uh, some position in the boards of the companies to get, and, and they got them, and they got their share uh, in the companies. And people who are not, people, I don't know, who are not uh, so important as generals, former colonels, uh, they just also got their shares in terms of, in terms of money because uh, they become much more well-paid because they started to pose uh, the threat to the companies. Because, uh, I don't know, any, any colonel, any former colonel can, uh, can now go to the security services and organize any kind of checks or uh, criminal case against the company. So people, uh, oligarchs and businessmen, they became much more attentive to, uh, to the KGB people's need. And they got their shares, they got a lot of money, they got better positions. It, uh, and also, you know, it's not depends on uh, oligarchs, but it depends on Putin, that when Putin came to power, he was very dependent on oligarchs. He was supported by, by the Yeltsin's family and by oligarchs who provided the Yeltsin's family with money and the political support. So uh, such names, uh, now it's forgotten, but such, uh, such person as a Berezovsky oligarch who committed suicide or maybe not here in London, he was a main in UK, in yeah. UK, uh, in UK. Uh, he was behind uh, behind Putin and behind Putin Putin's rights and other oligarchs. They were also very supportive of Putin. And remember, when Putin came to power in 2000, one of the first uh, his statement was that results of privatization, Russian privatization, the process when state assets uh, uh, were transferred to the oligarchs' hands. Uh, he said that uh, that uh, results of privatization would not be reconsidered. That means a lot to oligarchs. But uh, but since uh, a lot of time, uh, it's been a while since then. And when when Putin uh, felt that he is getting more stronger and stronger, and he supported more and more institutions uh, inside the country, uh, he. Uh, started his war against oligarchs. And you know that some oligarchs who were critical of the Kremlin were sent to prison like Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Some of them, uh, some of them pre uh, prefer, preferred to leave the country uh, because, uh, uh, because their assets started, uh, because their assets uh, were put, confiscated. At, put at, at risk and confiscated. And uh, like, Ten, eight years ago, the oligarchs were not so powerful as it was in the 90s. And uh, it's for oligarchs, it got even, even worse now because now they are, they, they all, all of them, they seem very frightened by Putin and by the Kremlin and by the security services. So because they are, all of them are under, are under surveillance, all of them are under control and uh, they know that and they are always in constant threat uh, to be put in prison if something goes wrong. So uh, it doesn't mean that oligarchs uh, doesn't play any role in Russia. They do, and they still own it, uh, a lot of assets in Russia. But now they know the rules, as, and this is, uh, these are Kremlin's rules, not their rules. And they're not in a position like it happened in the 90s to cooperate with the Kremlin and to I don't know, to, uh, to challenge the Kremlin. Now they can. Yeah, I think it's uh, dramatically changed after 2014, uh, after the annexation of Crimea. Uh, that was a moment- Sorry, the, sorry, uh, uh, Andre. It was just, uh, um, I, I, sh I should have said earlier, but there, there is a possibility to ask questions. Uh, 
Yeah. And uh, people who watch this can uh, uh, just uh, place them in the in, in the feed and, and they will get relayed to me. And I have one now, which was exactly what you were talking about, uh, uh, Andre. So I, I would like to just uh, to read that question to you. Um, uh, while we are still on the new nobility uh, versus middle class uh, segment before moving on to your, your next uh, books. So uh, this is a question regarding the relation of the Russian middle class towards the Putin regime. If they lost confidence 10 years ago because of persecution against minor successful citizens, what role played the invasion of Crimea for restoring uh, its confidence in the regime back in 2014 and today? So that's a very good question. Uh, as we all know, we got because of this disillusionment uh, in the middle classes, we got uh, the protests in Moscow in 2011 and 2012. And uh, nevertheless, Putin uh, got back to power, but he understood that he needed some new big idea to uh, win back uh, support from the middle classes. And basically, he found two big ideas. The first one was based on fear. And uh, around this time, uh, the war in, uh, the, well, not the war, how I can say, civil war in Libya was in full flu. And uh, Putin started, as, well, with the message that, look, if you want to support the political opposition, uh, you can uh, end up with uh, the blood on your streets. Uh, you can get a really bloody revolution, look at, Libya, look at Syria, look at what's going on in the Middle East, uh, Middle East. you would get exactly that on your so, so basically the Arab Spring was like a, a great uh, reference point for Putin at that time. Yes, yes. and he that's, used that as a really bad example. example. Yeah. Absolutely. And lots of people uh, actually got frightened. And lots of my friends who, uh, or my contacts, uh, who went to protests in 2011, uh, in 2012, uh, 2013, they got back to me and saying, well, maybe Putin is better than the bloody revolution. We don't want any repetition of the 1917 revolution uh, on our streets. It was a really powerful message, really powerful message. The second thing is that Putin found a new big idea about... Uh, that relates somehow to the national identity. The problem with the political opposition was that the only message was that uh, the Russian regime is corrupt, which is fine, but it's not very appealing. I mean, you cannot, it's, it's very negative to some, well, in terms of, uh, of the narrative. Putin came up with something much more appealing. He said, look, we are the greatest country in the world. We could get the best Olympic games in the world everybody would be happy and uh, we can grab Crimea if you want because now we have really good army and so many people got fascinated by that uh, it started with the Olympic Games but uh, Crimea was I would say the highest point and lots of people who are really liberal uh, they said well if it, that could be done so easily Putin is really smart he can do that, like just like that. Uh, we can get Crimea just like that, with no blood, with nothing, with not a single people, a, sig a single person killed. It's it's beautiful, and uh, that I would say strengthened his support among the middle classes, and people uh, got fascinated by this idea, and it lasted for several years. I think it's probably ended maybe just two years ago. So it had this lasting impact on the Russian society, uh, this fascination with the Crimea for maybe three years, maybe four. Only now people got really tired of the, of the Crimea and all these adventurers. But still, uh, to see Russian army in, um, in Syria, in Palmyra, was a great sign for lots of people. Lots of people got fascinated. Wow, we can get back. We are, uh, again, we are a superpower. We can dictate the United States what to do. They, they don't know what to do in, in Syria. We know we can fix this problem. We are powerful again. It's, um, it helped a lot of people in the middle classes to feel proud of themselves. And they mm. sort of, uh, it, it, it's a really smart play with, uh, with a national identity. 
Right. Yes, it's easy to make fun of these national ideas uh, projects, uh, but yeah, they they obviously have something uh, uh, some real significance. Um, um, look, uh, I was thinking of uh, moving on uh, a little bit and uh, and uh, now uh, ask you some questions that are um, related to the uh, the red web. And uh, reading that book, you realize how difficult it is to be the boss of Russia <laughs> because yeah. there's just so much chaos happening all the time and you have to try to figure out how to, uh, I mean, just the, the idea of control is, 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 uh, is a tough, problematic thing. Um, uh, of course, this uh, fall, there, has, uh, there have been uh, large and really powerful demonstrations in, in Belarus all across uh, uh, the country. And even though they have been met with very, you know, uh, um, forcefully by, by the government, uh, they also uh, closed down the internet. Um, uh, demonstrations are still ongoing and, uh, um, and the media has certainly played a role uh, in those demonstrations. I guess what you see is a little bit what you are kind of describing that there is a, a fissure, a crack between uh, authorities um, that are kind of becoming more repressive and more old-fashioned and the population that is moving in another direction. You were describing this with, with Russia, but maybe it's, it's pertinent also to, to, to Belarus. But uh, for instance, the, um, uh, the, the app Telegram has been very uh, important, as I understand it, in, in, in Belarus. And, and as I recall from your book, Red Web, the, the, uh, the, the Kremlin, uh, the Russian state had a kind of a difficult relationship with that app and with, uh, his name is Durov, I guess. The, uh, yeah. pa Pavel Durov. Pavel right. Durov. Yeah. right, so uh, maybe you could say a little bit about, uh, uh, um, uh, summarize a little bit about the, the, the problems of, uh, of Russia, uh, the Russian state and, and the internet. What, uh, what, uh, what are the threats? You, you, you talked about threats uh, earlier. And what are maybe the possibilities? I mean, uh, a couple of years ago in, in the United States, um, this was the biggest story, uh, you know. The, 2016, the, right. 2016 elections was more like a, 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 a new type of Pearl Harbor, uh, only, you know, more clever or something. So, um, of course, it's a, it's a story that, that we've been fed or uh, uh, <clears throat> know about a lot here in the West. But if, if you tell a little bit about um, the relationship between between Kremlin and and, and the internet. Uh, well, we uh, you know that the internet in Russia was absolutely free until 2012. It's it's interesting because everything was uh, the Kremlin tried to suppress every every independent institution, but internet was beyond the Kremlin's attention. Why? Because Putin mm -hmm. didn't believe in the internet. He was I don't know a, a little bit late on this train. So didn't, didn't he say something like uh, it's a CIA invention or something like that? Yes. Later he said that the internet was the invention of the CIA, and he really believed, still believes, believes, believes this, because it's I don't know very, it's a very common opinion for for the for the KGB guys. They really believe they could not believe they could not believe that such a thing could be could be created by another institutions, which in this case was uh, uh, was uh, Pentagon, not CIA. <laughs> uh, I mean, and a lot of uh, scientific institution across the United States and the Europe and and, and Europe. So, but this. I don't know, this thing is... Uh, it's too complicated. It's too complicated. <laughs> that, so it was a cooperation between different institutions and none of this institution was CIA. <laughs> Even then, uh, the American uh, state was involved. So, uh, but back then, Putin, in two, until 2012, Putin believed that uh, the internet is some kind of toy for for intelligentsia, for clever people. And But because he did not and does not believe in intelligence so he said that it doesn't matter internet does not matter but when people came to the street to protest against putin putin uh against putin coming back to to power in 2011 it, and all the protest was organized via internet on facebook on russian social network vkontakte on other on other uh, spaces on the internet like putin, twitter yeah. like twitter 
Putin was anger, angered, and the Kremlin us. Uh, and in 2012, the Kremlin launched uh, a uh, launched a censorship on the internet, and they uh, established, they introduced a special internet filtering system back then. And since then, uh, the Kremlin's fight against the internet can never stop, and it it, it have been developing and uh, uh, started. They started with blocking websites eight years ago, and now they produced and, and tried to introduce a, a system which looked like some kind of big red button that could block internet and every region in the country from the Kremlin. I mean, it's very, very general, general description of the idea, but they came to this idea. And uh, it's not very successful, I would say. They had some successes, uh, especially with um, old fashioned methods of uh, prosecution. Uh, for instance, if you pick up some random victims uh, who were active uh, on social media, especially in regions, uh, so you pick up this guy for saying th something about the church, and after that, this girl saying something about the governor, and uh, send them to jail or just fine them heavily. And of course, it would affect uh, the freedom of expression online because people, they just do not understand what is allowed and what is not. And uh, it had actually a big impact on uh, freedom of expression online, on Facebook, on Contactia, and uh, on other platforms. But uh, the problem is that uh, the, the main future uh, of the internet is uh, it actually let us express this ourselves spontaneously. For instance, and something happened uh, like behind this window, like a big I don't know, big explosion, big explosion of fire. Uh, the normal human reaction is to immediately post something about it. And at this moment, normal people, uh, even not people who are heavily politicized or are critical of the Kremlin, they have this urge to share this news with others. And because the internet uh, lets this happen and you can share this news immediately with millions of people, uh, it presents a big technological problem for the Kremlin. How to cope with this um, spontaneous uh, dissemination of information. So I would say right now the Kremlin sort of finds a way to some extent how to put under control political activists uh, people who are, uh, who are active uh, politically all the time. And they have some issues even, even there, but they do not know what to do if uh, something big happens and uh, people who usually do not care about politics uh, will start posting and sharing videos about this event. And this is exactly the reason they, uh, why they started building the system. Irina has described it. Uh, the system of, uh, it's called it national uh, sovereignty, uh, digital sovereignty internet. But the idea is to have a special uh, switch uh, to kill the internet in a particular region. So you have some problem in this, in this or that particular region and you kill the internet there and you isolate this region from the rest of the country. And that in theory would stop the dissemination of the information. Again, it's not really uh, effective. effective or successful. So uh, they tried this thing several times already. Uh, for instance, for almost two years, uh, there were protests in Ingushetia and uh, the internet was killed several times in the region. It didn't, it didn't help. Now we have this uh, protest in Khabarovsk. And uh, if you want to see and to watch these videos, they're still available and you can read all the news about what's going on in the region. Again, the protest in Minsk and Belarus, they are still available. Uh, this information is not suppressed. Uh, so the internet is still a formidable, I would say, formidable uh, te technological challenge uh, for the Kremlin. What we know uh, and what we are capable of doing, they know how to, uh, how to deal with people. And uh, Pavel Durov is uh, might be one of the most interesting examples of the Kremlin strategy. So Pavel Durov started as a, uh, as a uh, he launched uh, and he made a big name when he launched his own uh, social uh, network of uh, Kontakte. 
and it became hugely popular and still the most popular social network in, in our country. And maybe, yeah, maybe Contact or maybe Adnaklasniki, but it might be the second. And uh, with millions and millions of, uh, of, of, of supporters. And uh, when we got the protest in 2011 and 12, uh, the FSB tried to, uh, to suppress some, uh, some, some of the groups on Contacti of, uh, of activists. And Durov said no. In 2014, when, the, uh, when Maidan started in, in Ukraine, again, the FSB approached Durov, uh, asking him, actually requesting him, to share some information about identity of, uh, of Ukrainian activists. And again, he said no. Uh, so it was really brave of him. And uh, subsequently, he lost his company and he fled the country. And he launched uh, Telegram, his new application, kind of messenger, uh, from abroad. Uh, and uh, Telegram was almost immediately blocked. Not very successfully, it was still available, uh, but it was officially blocked. But what happened next is uh, in this summer, uh, Pavel Durov understood that uh, there is no way to develop his application uh, in the West. And he came to some sort of agreement with the Kremlin. And as a result, his uh, application uh, telegram was unblocked uh, on the Russian territory. And he was, um, and there is, there was a message from the Kremlin that uh, Telegram now could uh, actually operate in Russia, had its office in Russia, and uh, that provoked all kinds of um, all kinds of um, fears among the Russian uh, cyber community, uh, whether we still could trust Telegram or not. It's still a very hot issue, and nobody knows the answer to this question. Pavel Durov, of course always says that it's absolutely safe, uh, but because of his uh, close cooperation with the Russian authorities, uh, nobody knows. Uh, but I would say that trust in his app uh, suffered dramatically. Mm. Right, yes. Uh, uh, as I recall, you made the comparison between uh, on, on the, the question of internet and how to manage it. You made a comparison between China and Russia in that uh, China was able to kind of develop its own uh, uh, chai, Chinet <laughs> uh, <laughs> within the Great Firewall. And exactly. uh, Russia only uh, got on the issue much later and the Russian state has always been reacting and reactive. Uh, so uh, the, the, the image I had after reading that book was, uh, uh, was Putin playing this, you know, the whack-a-mole, uh, the game where there, there are moles coming up and you have to whack them on the head and they're all <laughs> everywhere. And that's how you deal with problems in the Kremlin somehow, uh, the kind of a whack-a-mole um, thing. I just wanted to ask you one more question about, uh, or uh, talk about one more thing from the Red Web, and that is um, the issue of surveillance. Um, of course, uh, I, uh, we saw that uh, Edward Snowden just uh, uh, had his um, uh, residence in Russia confirmed now, I think this uh, summer or fall. And he, uh, he's getting his citizenship. Russian and citizen. getting his citizenship, yes. Uh, of course, he, uh, he fled the United States uh, after exposing uh, a number of intrusive government programs there and, and uh, surveillance that, were, that was uh, uh, obviously uh, um, borderline, to <laughs> put it mildly, in, 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 in the United States. But uh, in Russia, you describe a, uh, I, I guess it's kind of a program called the uh, SORM, yeah. Um, which uh, has some of the same um, uh, capabilities as the programs exposed by Snowden in the United States, yes? Maybe uh, you could talk a little bit about that. It's uh, to some extent, the, pro the biggest difference between uh, the American approach and uh, the Russian approach is that uh, the Americans, we use so-called uh, mass surveillance. It means that they collect all data uh, which comes through the United States territory. And uh, for that, you need to build huge facilities uh, to store all this data. And it's extremely expensive. Uh, so the Russian government's approach is a bit different. They, uh, they use uh, not mass surveillance, but uh, selective um, targeted surveillance, which means that uh, you first you need to identify your targets 
like Navalny, I don't know, uh, political op oppositions, op opposition uh, activist, uh, just activist. Uh, you you make a list and then you put them under under surveillance. And this system is um, is very effective, and it's extremely totalitarian. It's much more totalitarian than the American system because it's actually there is no way uh, to uh, for the outside check what is actually is going on, how many people are surveilled, why they are under surveillance. It's yeah. absolutely yeah. there is no way to Let detect that. Let me give that. you one example, like uh, uh, the United States they gathered a lot of information on the American citizens and people in Europe. And they stored this information in their data stories, and nothing happened. But uh, in Russia, Boris Nemtsov, an opposition politician who went uh, uh, who went a war against the Kremlin and against the Kremlin's corruption and Putin personally, he was put under legal surveillance, uh, like uh, two years before he was killed. He was put under surveillance. His uh, uh, phone calls and uh, emails was intercepted and then leaked on the internet and it became available for everybody. And uh, he applied to the security services uh, in order to, in, uh, he sure. asked okay. them to investigate uh, these leaks and whom he was surveilled and for why, for why reasons, but he failed. And just two or three years past, he was killed. He was killed, uh, and uh, he was killed like I don't know, one kilometers, uh, not uh, one kilometers from the Kremlin. No, it's a, so, even closer. It's even closer, it's even even closer. closer for a few hundred meters from the Kremlin. So that's that's the difference. So <laughs> that's very clear. He was surveilled, and after that, he was killed, and we never knew what happened with who surveilled on him, but it's clear that people who intercepted his communication somehow involved in his killings, his murder. Right, so uh, maybe <clears throat> we can hope, or maybe not really, uh, that uh, Snowden will make a big disclosure about uh, <laughs> Russian surveillance state also. Uh, so we have about half an hour uh, left. I want to move on to uh, compatriots, but uh, there were a few follow-up questions from the uh, what we've been talking about uh, so far. And um, uh, uh, one was about the 2014 um, Ukraine invasion, Russian idea and middle class. And, and the follow-up question is this. Uh, thanks for a very interesting answer. If possible, besides the internet, how does the Belarusian broad, popular, persistent, and peaceful uprising influence uh, on the relation between the Russian middle class and the Putin regime? That was the one question. And the second was a bit uh, uh, shorter, I guess. It's uh, regarding Telegram. Are there any new attempts to close down the Telegram app by Russian authorities? No, Telegram is uh, absolutely free now, and uh, even uh, the Russian uh, censorship agency, uh, call it Roskomnadzor, uh, they publicly announced that they opened an account, uh, a channel on Telegram. So now it's uh, officially sanctioned by, by, the, by the Russian censorship agency that it's fine to use Telegram. Um, well, about Belarus, it's a bit more complicated. The problem is that you cannot portray the events in uh, in Minsk as a bloody revolution because there is no blood I mean I mean committed by by uh, by protesters and it's a big problem for the Kremlin uh, they played this card with with blood on the streets with Syria and with Maidan because it was really kind of messy but with Minsk uh, the Russian internet is uh, it's full with uh, videos of uh, Belarusian protesters clean the streets after them. And uh, the image what we have, I mean, the ordinary Russians about Minsk, that it's extremely clean city. So the problem is that you cannot play these cards the Kremlin has been playing with for so many years that any kind of protest is a chaos and mess and bloody and horrible, that everything done for, for, the, for the order is fine. Because in this case, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So I would say that right now, ordinary Russians, they are very supportive of what's going on in, in Minsk and in Khabarovsk. It's a very new development. We actually, we do not know how far it goes, uh, but uh, right now it's like that. 
Right, it's very interesting, and it, it must give Russian authorities kind of a dilemma about how to, to deal with this, you know, should you stay with uh, Lukashenko, who was kind of uh, trusted the keeper of order for so long, or should you side with the others and hope that you could control them afterwards? Um, oh no, was... there is no choice for the Russian authorities, they made their choice, they, the Kremlin and Putin decided to support Lukashenko. Yeah, unfortunately. So, unfortunately, it couldn't be such a choice for the Kremlin because there are very clear parallels between Lukashenko and Putin. And if one fails, it means not very good perspective for another mm. dictator. Right. <clears throat> okay. So um, we are moving on to the compatriots. Um, and. Uh, um, you know, I was thinking of a genre, how to describe the book uh, uh, when I talked about, of course, it's about the, the uh, Russian uh, emigre population, the diasporas uh, and the various, you know, different uh, uh, diasporas that have come from Russia and from the Soviet Union uh, over the years. But uh, um, <clears throat> but I, I was thinking of like, it, it's also kind of a, a thriller and a cloak and polonium uh, type. Mm. <laughs> Uh, uh, about a lot of the uh, the the uh, you know uh, extreme operations of the Russian secret services abroad, such as the killing of Trotsky and, and others. Um, so you start uh, uh, very early uh, already in the twenties with the establishment of a uh, department for uh, um, foreign operations within the Cheka um of the uh, of the soviets of the bolsheviks in the 1920s maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, um uh why you start already so uh, early uh what is the relevance for today you think and uh, and and just to give a brief presentation uh, about about this book which i recommend to everybody well let me start maybe okay. uh just a few words that why we started so early uh, well, we have this uh, excellent quote in our book uh, by Richard Eldridge, one of the best British historians of, uh, of intelligence, who said that basically there is a big difference between um, intelligence agencies in uh, democratic countries and in uh, authoritarian or totalitarian countries. And this difference is that in uh, democratic countries, the intelligence agency is about collecting information. It's about intelligence. In countries with uh, uh, totalitarian or authoritarian regimes, intelligence is about policing the emigres and protecting the regime. And uh, for us, it was really striking when we researched this book that fighting Russians abroad, fighting the Russian emigres, was a defining moment for the Russian intelligence because the regime from the very beginning, from starting from Lenin and ending with Putin uh, has been always obsessed with the threat posed by political emigres. And it started really early. And the reason for that is very, I would say, ahistorical. <laughs> and the problem is that uh, we have in, uh, in our textbooks, in our schools, uh this this problem uh, we in in russian textbooks uh the first world war never properly explained and uh, so what you have you have instead you have the history of the russian empire and all of a sudden you have the history of revolution taught in a way that a small bunch of emigres with some help of the german general staff comes to russia and destroyed the most powerful empire in the world, uh, probably with the most powerful secret police in the world. Uh, taking the First World War as a big contributing factor to the revolution out of the question. And uh, in, uh, in the, of course, we all know that uh, the First World War was a very big uh, thing and actually destroyed not one, but four empires in Europe, and it's uh, Austrian Empire, German Empire, Turkish Empire, and Russian Empire. But in Russian textbooks, it's all about this small bunch of emigres, which might, if they're given the chance, they can destroy the political stability in the country. 
And uh, well, that's actually prompted this obsession that if given a chance, no matter how small this group or how insignificant they are, still they can get back to the country and do something about political stability and destroy the political regime. Because that's just what happened in 1917. And uh, that's why we decided to trace uh, the origins of this obsession to the very beginning, to, to the 20s, because it started right there in, uh, in when, when uh, Lenin just died. Right. <clears throat> and then, um, and then you, yeah, so you start with the, the description of the killing of a uh, white general, I guess, uh, Kutupov um in uh, paris yes and then uh, you you move on and 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 describe also um how trotsky was uh, hunted down and the various plots to try to kill him um so he was also here in norway but uh, he he survived <laughs> <laughs> uh, but just for a brief time until he was uh, later found in in um in um in uh, in uh, in mexico but could you uh, could you describe a little bit about the uh, the changes and the developments of the russian uh, foreign service and uh, you also say something about uh, that uh, at the time of the collapse of the soviet union the uh, foreign intelligence departments of the kgb were renamed, but they also somehow invented the history of themselves as more liberal, uh, yes. in a sense, yes. or worldly. You know, we had they had seen the world and knew what was right for for Russia in some part, and were reformers in a sense. Uh, I thought that was interesting, and also linking up to your description of the new nobility, um, in, in a sense. Yeah, you never know when you. Uh, when you start uh, writing a book, you never know uh, what you, what would you find out eventually. And when we started our research uh, for uh, for the compatriots, I was sure and Andre was sure that our security services, especially our intelligence services, as they are, are very unlike uh, very unlike uh, from the Soviet. Uh, from the Soviet security services, from the first department of the KGB, and especially from the NKVD uh, foreign department in Australia at Dell. But when we finished our research for the book, we found out that, oh dear, they are so similar to each other. It's not to the same extent. They are still uh, doesn't, they are not so aggressive as it used to be back into the 20s and the 30s, but there is the same way of thinking. The, the, there is the same way, there is the same task, uh, and there are so many similarities between them. And their textbooks are, are still originated in the same time. Their heroes are still from the same, from the searches, from the 40s, from the 50s, and mostly from the searches and 40s. And they still wanted to be uh, the same powerful and the same, uh, the same terrible and formidable as, as as foreign foreign department of the NKVD, and it was to me it was revelations, uh, because in the nineties uh, and early two thousand, uh, the SVR organized a huge campaign. They wanted they wanted to uh, they wanted to make a big difference from the Soviet from the Soviet Soviet police, who was involved into mass repressions and killed a lot of millions. Uh, secret killed, police, yeah. Secret police and killed. Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of Soviet people, innocent Soviet people. And they put a lot of efforts to, uh, to, dis to distance themselves, the first department of the KGB, which is intelligence, from all, from the, from all KGB. And this attempt was successful because they told a lot of stories, they told a lot of stories of uh, espionage, beautiful stories, but killings were not involved. Any kind of violence were not involved, was not involved. And all the stories, uh, they met journalists, I mean, people from the SVR met journalists regularly. They organized kind of talks and provide information about interesting and thrilling espionage case back into the 80s and 70s. And all these cases was about espionage, about uh, 
people who were operating in white gloves and have nothing to do and had nothing to do with uh, with killings and uh, other dirty methods. So they represent themselves as they just like the MI6 uh, or CIA, or, CIA, or maybe CIA much more much more dirty than <laughs> like 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 they 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 love to, to compare themselves with uh with the with, with British intelligence. So uh, we are. Uh, um, even we, uh, given the fact that we were always critical to the of the camera uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the KGB, of the KGB and of the security services, even we, uh, to some extent, uh, believed uh, in the stories and the, this new image of the of SVR. And and when we found out that they that this was a, when we researched for the book, we found out that. This new image was a special operations, active measures organized by the SVR for uh, for the public for to change public opinion in the 90s because they were afraid of being of being put under investigation, of being put under repressions of of some kind of. Uh, we feared the fate of Stasi, uh, actually. Right. That was the biggest fear. And so this operation was successful, <laughs> completely yeah. successful, and uh, most of. Most of, of the general public believed that uh, that the SVR and the first department of the KGB, the Soviet intelligence, was innocent in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of killings and murderers and and crimes. They are absolutely different. And it's uh, it's, it's striking that uh, it's about so many people. So you can have uh, SVR generals, uh, present SVR generals, talking about this. Or you can have uh, some former uh, officers of the first uh, chief directorate of the KGB, now oligarchs. For instance, Alexander Lebedev, uh, uh, who is a very big uh, name now in Russia because he's an oligarch and his son was just made a peer, a lord uh, in the United Kingdom. Right. And uh, he, he, is he, saying, he also owns newspapers, I think. The, yeah, two, two, the two British Junior, newspapers. Yeah, independent the even. And, and the Evening Standard. Yeah. And uh, he, he says in his book that basically uh, the first chief directorate of the KGB was um, populated by dissidents. It's just like, what? Uh, because we were worldly, because exactly what you described, because we saw the world, we were not really happy with... Uh, uh, with the strict measures uh, used by the KGB inside the country, and they were rebellious, and they were liberal. No, it was not the case. And uh, we discovered many things and put our, uh, these things in our book, and specifically that actually the, the, the Russian intelligence always um, actually took part in uh, suppressing uh, dissent, political dissent. Uh, so if you have some Russian dissidents uh, in the country, Soviet dissidents, attacked by the KGB, when these people were sent or expelled from the country, like Solzhenitsyn, now it was uh, the task for the foreign intelligence to spy on them, to discredit them, to compromise them, uh, to plant some crazy stories about them in uh, Russian and uh, Western media. So it was always like that. And it's still like that. Uh, what we wanted to achieve in our book is to prove this continuity. And that's why the book is based on uh, the history of one family. Because it's, um, for us, it was really interesting that you can start with some Czechists who were really prominent back in the 1920s. And we have two main protagonists active already in the, in the late 20s. And one of them actually helped to organize uh, the assassination of Trotsky. And to have this family uh, active in foreign intelligence right all these days. And one of the uh, actually successors of his family, he became an emigre himself successors. because he, um, well, he, uh, he, uh, he took into some, uh, he, he got into some trouble with, uh, with the Russian authorities. Uh, he was sent to jail and now he lives uh, mostly in Germany. He became an emigrant. Uh, he actually he became a political emigrant. His, uh, his granddad was fighting these people and he became an, um, somebody, his, uh, his granddad uh, had been fighting for like four decades. There's no family without a black sheep, I think uh, Putin mm -hmm. said at some point. 
Um, just uh, I, we get a lot of questions, and and I'm I'm sorry I don't think I have the possibility to ask all of them. And I want to go back to some of what we you mentioned and discussed now. Um, uh, uh, later, maybe especially um, thinking also about uh, uh, Norway, and um, because uh, um, the the biggest uh, population from Russia uh, in our country uh, are uh, uh, Chechens, which is constitutes I don't know fifteen thousand people or or so, uh, who have all come uh, over the last twenty years. <clears throat> and and uh, and um, um, but uh, uh, moving over to this this question, which was uh, interesting, I think um, uh, it's like this: uh, in regards to Russian intelligence and using digital tools uh, to promote their foreign policy and destabilize European democracies, um, what are your thoughts on the usage of international banking as a concealed way of carrying out their foreign policy? They have done so before and currently. Uh, the uh, any thoughts on that and and just to add because in the, in your book in compatriots you describe a little bit about this yeah which exactly is, to me very interesting that the uh, Soviet Union uh, within the 70s and 80s uh, create uh, banks abroad with the explicit purpose of uh, funneling uh, hard currency back so selling raw goods and getting hard currency back because <laughs> it was bankrupt um, uh, and uh, and at some stage, the, uh, the, these banks were reversed so, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, so that they would channel money out of Russia. Uh, and, and then you end up describing this huge scandal uh, in New York, uh, at the Bank of New York at the end of the uh, 1990s. Um, yeah, sorry, but uh, uh, the, the, um, um, the use of international banking as a concealed way of carrying out uh, a foreign policy was the question. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, actually it's a very good question because right now uh, the Russian authorities are thinking really hard of what to do about this problem because actually the reason why uh, back in the 60s actually the Soviet authorities uh, created their own banks in the West, we wanted to avoid control uh, of, the, of the United States authorities. The problem is if you send a dollar uh, I mean, in, in US currency, you immediately uh, spotted by, by the American authorities. There is no way to avoid this kind of control. Uh, no matter it's going on in Russia or abroad, it's because uh, the way the, the, the international banking system built. And uh, for that, the Soviet authorities, they invented their own kind of currency. It was called Euro dollars. And the idea was these dollars, they never they never uh, ended up in, in the American system with real and mixed up with real do dollars because we wanted to avoid this kind of uh, tracing from the Americans. So now it's getting a bit more complicated. And, 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 and they wanted to avoid that to avoid also lawsuits. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because we didn't want to be, uh, exactly. Uh, but they also back then they supported lots of uh, guerrillas, uh, guerrillas movements in, in Africa, in Latin and South America, and we wanted to have these uh, transfers completely untraceable by the Americans. They had the same problem now because of the sanctions. You have Western sanctions, and, uh, and it means that my, many of these transfers might be just stopped, or of course we can be traced. So what we are thinking of now is uh, about uh, cryptocurrency. And there are several projects in Russia and there are lots of people thinking really hard how they can use cryptocurrency, maybe Russian cryptocurrency, maybe some uh, international cryptocurrency to avoid this kind of tracing from the Americans. It's very far from, uh, from uh, actual usage. So they're still thinking, uh, but they're thinking really hard. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess the, the, the whole um, issue of those banks um, and uh, and the uh, um, and the and the kind of uh, the businesses of uh, the Soviet Union abroad, they were also mostly controlled by the KGB, I guess, and uh, and um, and um, 
And in that sense, I guess that uh, uh, one advantage of the SVR or the foreign intelligence branches of the KGB were that they, they had actual some experience with businesses, uh, with business, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> when, when the market came to Russia. That's why um, we had get so many foreign intelligence officers in, uh, in Russian banks. Right, right. Yeah, so it's, it's from there. Um, look, um, uh, I, I have a couple of questions I would like to, uh, to, uh, to ask. And, and uh, uh, I think that the, 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 the um, focus or the, the knowledge about uh, um, uh, so-called wet operations or, or, I mean, assassinations abroad uh, uh, by the Russian state have, have gotten more attention, especially since the Skripal case in, in, in the UK. Uh, uh, maybe you could say a little bit about the um, 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 consequences of that operation within uh, um, uh, the SVR uh, or uh, the GRU, I mean, the, 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 because this was a military. First of all, there was also a question, maybe you could talk a little about a different uh, type of, uh, of uh, services uh, involved uh, and distinguish a little bit about them, then a little bit about the consequences uh, of the Skripal uh, case and, and, and what it means. And, um, and, uh, and then I have this, this question of, uh, about uh, Chechens uh, uh, and, and Chechnya and, uh, and uh, the specific uh, issues relating to that diaspora. Maybe you stay, uh, take the first question, I answer the second. The first question is about... A definition the between the uh, three agencies we have, and I am talking about Chechens. Okay. Yeah, so, the, the, the three, the, the services and the, and the Skripal case, uh, Irina, okay. if you may. Uh, and and uh, I will get back because I have some other stuff on the Chechen yeah. issue, but yeah. Okay. So we Thanks, have the three, the, uh, there are three main major in, uh, secret services in Russia. The FSB, which is counterintelligence service, and uh, it's in charge of what's going on inside the country. The SVR, which is intelligence uh, and uh, normal uh, intelligence, and the GRU, which is military intelligence and in charge of uh, of military of gathering military information. So uh, the GRU, as we can see, the GRU is uh, the most uh, noisy and uh, say uh, in terms of uh, in terms of leaving traces, unsuccessful security service. Because uh, we know that uh, <clears throat> we know about involvement of JRU in the many uh, assassinations abroad, including Skripal's case. Uh, but we also we also know that other security services like the, uh, the like the FSB uh, also not very I don't know not also very uh, very cautious uh, because uh, when uh, Alexander Litvinenko was killed. Uh, in 2006 in the United Kingdom, uh, at least one former KGB officer was involved in this case. Uh, now he's a Russian parliamentarian Lugavo and he was convicted in this. So uh, in terms of... Uh, and, uh, convicted in the United States. In, here, <laughs> here, in the UK. In the UK. In the United Kingdom. Yes. And, yeah, sorry. And assassination of Litvinenko. And so uh, they're all... Uh, they're all left traces, some traces, and in terms of uh, consequences for, for them and in terms of punishment for them, we don't know anything about this because it seems that a failure, uh, failure does not matter, uh, doesn't have a, a bad impact on the, on, and bad consequences for the security services, for the Russian security services, because uh, after, uh, after Lugavoy was caught red-headed, uh, by uh, red-headed uh, after Litvinenko murderer, he uh, his he wouldn't punish. He would not Russia. be punished. He yeah, not, he, he wouldn't punish. He, he he was not punished in Russia. He was uh, he was promoted to the higher position and he got a higher position in the Russian parliament. So uh, I can see any bad consequences for the general after Skripal's uh, Skripal's and his daughter attempt as assassination attempt because it seems that they uh, get got away with this and maybe um, because it's it's so strange but because uh, uh, all these uh, assassinations all these attempt assassin of uh, attempt assassinations demonstrate uh, demonstrate to the world that Russia are still in in the game Russia are still powerful we still can 
do any something terrible abroad we can still this we can still uh can still uh, go for our enemies so far it's it's after our enemies, uh, so. after the, it's, uh, it, uh, that's why there is no bad consequences for the security services they were not punished to me it's a kind of uh, unfortunately it's kind of a win-win situation uh and we see that not only with uh, assassination uh, attempts but also with uh, hacking operations if they are successful they steal information and compromise people if they are not successful and get exposed uh all of a sudden you see russia back on the world stage as a super major uh superpower as a kind of king maker in uh, in the most powerful country in the world in the united states uh talked about uh incessantly in in the west as a as a power we need to uh count on and it's uh, i think it's it's a win-win situation if you even if you lose tactically still you get a lot of support inside of the country i mean inside inside of russia because all of a sudden you see that your leader and your country is uh, the most talked about country in the world it's one thing um well about chechens is uh, it's a very difficult question yes yes I, I just i just wanted to make a short intro on that because i think it is uh, uh well first of all this is the anna polikovskaya seminar and she had a special interest uh, in in chechnya uh, and covered it a lot and was also here meeting the chechen diaspora here but if you take just a few examples from this year 2020 so in january a chechen blogger was killed in france in February, uh, the most famous of all the oppositional Chechen bloggers was attacked at, uh, in his house in Sweden. He lived on a secret address by a guy with a hammer. And uh, uh, actually, he then overpowered his attacker. But uh, anyway, there was such an attack. And in July, uh, one of the other famous bloggers uh, in the Chechen uh, community was killed in Austria. Um, and then there was an incident also in Finland with a, uh, a Chechen blogger there in, in August. Um, so, uh, and this is of course uh, also um, accompanied by a lot of threats and, uh, and, uh, uh, and aggression coming from the Chechen government against people abroad who are, you know, not telling the right thing and, 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 and doing bad stuff. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, and it's also, I think, uh, 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 in some cases, probably in conjunction with uh, Russian federal forces or federal services, some of these operations, I would, I would assume. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that, Andre. So the problem here is that, um, uh, well, Kadyrov's uh, security services are extremely active and not completely uh under control of of the kremlin and uh and they have very tricky relationship with the russian security services and why it is so tricky is that because they were really smart and found a way how it became absolutely indispensable uh for the russian security services why is that the problem here is that um, right now as we all know the russian say relations with other countries are not really good but there is one card you can always play on is a cooperation in counterterrorism and that's why if for instance you have some western leaders not really keen to talk to the russian foreign minister lavrov they still are very much uh, like to talk to the fsb because it's about national security it's about counterterrorism cooperation mm. and i just uh, wanted to remind you that even after the 2016 uh, uh, Russian interference, uh, we got a visit of uh, chiefs of three Russian intelligence agencies, the FSB, SVR, and GRU in Washington because, and these people were already under sanctions because it was about counterterrorism cooperation. The thing about counterterrorism operation, it's always about sharing information. And uh, here, the Russian security services, they, uh, they heavily rely on, on Chechen uh, secret services. Why is that? We have this problem in Syria. We have the problem of, um, say, Islamist in, uh, underground in Europe. And the Russian secret services are not really successful at penetrating these networks. 
And uh, there was a case, very famous case, when an, uh, an agent of uh, an asset of the Russian FSB was actually killed in Turkey because he was identified uh, by ISIS operatives immediately and he was killed very publicly. And the message was, do, do not try to send your, your, your agents uh, to, to us. We would identify and kill them. But Chechens were in much better position to penetrate Islamist networks because of diaspora. Chechens diaspora is, uh, very, is, is, is really large, not only in Europe, but also in the Middle East. There are Chechen villages even in Palestine. Uh, there are people, Cherkassian and Chechens in, uh, in Jordan, in Israel, in Syria, in, uh, in, so in Turkey, of course. And that gives Kadyrov's people such a great opportunity. They have this option that they can collect some information in these uh, diasporas and then trade on this information with the Russian security services to then let the Russian security services to use this information talking with the Western counterparts. The other another, thing- Another win-win situation. I, absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Andre. I, I think I have to cut you short because our time is up and ah, I'm okay. reminded constantly uh, by the others. What about our parliament? You know, <laughs> the, the question was, uh, uh, why did Russia hack the Norwegian parliament? So if you could uh, end uh, this whole um, meeting just by saying a little bit about what you could uh, think were the Russian objectives, or Irina, maybe uh, the Russian objectives in, in Norway, and uh, um, uh, how we should think about uh, uh, this issue. It's, it's both about uh, tactical things, so it's about collecting information because it's a NATO country, and uh, of course it's, uh, it's a very huge interest in the Russian security services, uh, uh, but it's also about projection of power. If an, even if you get caught, as I said, you might project your power. You can send this uh, very intimidating message uh, that we can do that. And actually, the cost for these operations are really, uh, are really low. It's not like you are sending your spies or not you are sending your mercenaries, which might be really costly and might uh, get you in a really big trouble. But hacking operations are cost effective, I would say. Yeah, and you know, Russia, um, a few years ago, Russia launched its cyber troops, which, uh, uh, which is under general control. And we also have a lot of just professional, great hackers because we have a, 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 a great mathematician school in, in the country. So right. we, are, we have a lot of abilities. Russia has a lot of abilities to attack to, to attack all cyber all cyber assets uh, in, in Europe and in the United States. And Russia used this because as Andre said, the cost is cheap, but the result might be great. But they also did some mistake like it happened with, uh, with attacks uh, on DNC uh, in the United States in 2016, where the cost was, uh, in, uh, where the eventual cost was much, much bigger than it's supposed to be, and that ruined Russia-American relationship for years. But in terms of Norway, I know, um, I think uh, that's mostly about gathering information and still and again, secrets. And projection power, I think it's still the same thing. Right. Okay, on that note, I will check my devices for the security stuff I have on them to be sure. And mm -hmm. um, thank you a lot for this really, really interesting uh, Thank you for having hours. us. Yes, and I would suggest to everybody who has not done so already, do uh, check up on uh, uh, the books of uh, uh, Irina and Andre. They are, um, I, I have to say that they're not only full of information, but they're extremely well written. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you all. And thank bye you bye. for having us here. Bye. Bye.